All right, we're going to continue our series on challenging the teaching of sovereignty. We're going to uh, go through this list of 137 scriptures that people choose to support the, the concept that God is in control of everything. And what I'm trying to put across is that God doesn't have to control anything. He's given us his word and uh, we have a choice either to listen to his word or not. Today, we're going to go on a bit of a journey. Um, I'm going to read the scripture that we have in our list. Then I'm going to talk about what God has said before. Isaiah 43, 13 is on that list of 137 scriptures. And it goes like this. Isaiah 43, 13 says, Yea, before the day was, I am he. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it, or who shall allow it, or who shall change it? These scriptures are taken out of context. I think we've done a good job as far as so far. We've taken these scriptures, read the context. But today, I want to talk about the concept that this scripture is actually true, but not in the sense of sovereignty. It says, before the day was, I am. There's none that can deliver out of my hand. That is true. The Bible tells us what God told the children of Israel. If you will be faithful to me, then whoever attacks you, I will help you. Then he said, if you become unfaithful, you, in other words, you are not remaining faithful, you become unfaithful and you follow other gods, then the enemy that comes against you will defeat you. Do you see? That verse is true. There is none that can deliver out of my hand either way. If you're faithful to me, in other words, you keep covenant with me, then the enemy that comes against you None can deliver them out of my hand. Do you see that? It's true. Now, if you flip it the other way, if the children of Israel became unfaithful, if the enemy came against them, God said, they will take you captive. Again, it is true. None can deliver out of my hand because I have already said it. Now, today, we're going to go on a bit of a journey. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is where some of these commandments and so on are mentioned. Like, we'll start off in verse 1. Deuteronomy 6, 1 says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. So let's go down. He talks about, you know, we're supposed to keep the word of the Lord before us, teach your children, and so on. Verse 13 says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods or the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from all off the face of the earth. And this is where that phrase comes, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Jesus quoted that when he was being tempted in the wilderness, mm -hmm. and he said to the devil, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, do you see what I mean? It can go both ways. If you serve the Lord and the enemy comes against you, no one can take the enemy out of his hand. But if you become unfaithful, then the enemy comes against you 
again, no one is going to be able to deliver you. See, it's covenant. Mm -hmm. So when we read verses like this that we saw in Isaiah 43, 13, there is none that can deliver out of my hand. It is true, but not in the sense that the sovereignty teaching says it. They make it sound like it's as if they think that God kind of decides as he goes along. One day, I'll bless you. I'll deliver you. I'll help you. And on another day, he says, I'm going to let the enemy come in and take you. Yeah, he determines. He determines everything. Mm -hmm. But as you go through these scriptures, and if you understand covenant, here in Deuteronomy, the people are making a covenant with God. Mm -hmm. And he is laying down the terms of this covenant. The blessings and the curses. I'm going to go to the next chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 12 says, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken... I want you to notice that word if. Yeah. The word if does not fit in the sovereignty teaching. They teach God does and there's no if. But he is saying this. If you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swore unto your fathers. Who are their fathers? We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. See, God made covenants with all of them, including way back, we can go back to Noah. God made a covenant with Noah. I was thinking of even doing a word study of finding wherever the word if shows up. Because that changes everything when you're looking at this concept of God controlling the word if. If you listen, I will do this. If you will not listen, I will do this. You see, by the time you get to the book of Isaiah, God isn't just deciding on the, in a moment's time as to what's going to happen to the people. He has predetermined his covenant, but he has not predetermined who and when those people will hearken to the judgments and the commandments of God. God does not control anything. He has a covenant. And he gives you the chance to either be blessed or to be cursed. Like if you read on, it says, verse 13, he will love you, bless you, multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your land, your corn, your wine, your oil, the increase of your kind or your, your sheep and goats and so on, the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee. Now again, I'm going to make sure we understand. They're coming into a land that God promised through their fathers. Now, how far back are we going to go? Remember, we were talking about Noah. And it was his son that offended Noah. He saw his nakedness. Noah was the one that said, Cursed be Canaan. They're going into the land of Canaan. So God is keeping covenant with these people, not only through Moses. He's keeping the covenant that was sworn to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if we go way back to Genesis, he's keeping the covenant that was made through Noah. That Canaan would be servants to all his brothers. So sure enough, they're coming into this promised land. God is not sending them into a land, taking the land away from people. You know, this is where sovereignty could come in. They would say, well, God is just sending them into this land to take this land away 
But you see, God is not working without covenant. Mm -hmm. He is working with the covenant that he has made with people of faith. If these people have faith as they come into the promised land, faith, I don't mean faith to like take step by step. I mean faith in who God is. Mm -hmm. He is a covenant keeping God. If they have that faith in him, then he is going to help them as they come into the promised land. But I'm saying the promise goes way back, not only to Abraham, but it can go all the way back to Genesis again through Noah. Mm -hmm. And all the promises that I'm reading in Deuteronomy here about those that come against you, I will deliver them into your hand. He's saying, don't forget the Lord now. He's bringing you into this land. Don't forget about him. Don't be like the children of Israel. When he was bringing them through the wilderness, he provided manna from heaven. He provided water. Their clothes did not wear out. He took care of them. Don't be like them when they complained about not having water. They actually... It, you know, if it was just an innocent complaint, they would say, well, we don't have water. No, they didn't do that. They said, God brought us this far to kill us. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. That's the kind of complaining that is not faith. If it was just an innocent thing saying, I'm thirsty, you see, that's not sin. But they were actually accusing God of bringing them this far after doing all the miracles, delivering them from Egypt, coming through the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, the water from the rock, all those miracles. Then they said, God brought us into this land for us to die. I see that as them saying, or they have just accused God of being evil. They're accusing God of being evil, mm -hmm. which is interesting to me because the church today, the modern church, accuses God of being evil. What I'm trying to say as we challenge this concept of sovereignty, Calvinism is on the extreme end, okay? okay? Here's what the church can't admit, is that the church has been influenced with that thinking so therefore, Christians say every day that God is directing my path throughout my day, every day, through circumstances. There is more verses coming up that are from Isaiah, and I'm glad that they're quoting verses out of Isaiah because I understand the book. There's a theme going on. When you have rulers like Uzziah and Ahaz, they're evil. Sure enough, when the enemy came in, bad things happened, right? But when you have a ruler like Hezekiah, that was a good story, wasn't it? Learning that God would keep covenant either way. If you're going to be unfaithful to me, the enemy's going to beat the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you are faithful to me like Hezekiah, then I will show myself strong on your behalf. It is either way. God does keep his word none can deliver from his hand but it isn't like god is just deciding to bless one day and curse you the next day he's laid this all out beforehand so all these scriptures that talk about the former things they don't go and read the former things the former things are recorded this is what god said that he laid it out it can't be former if it's not recorded. Right. But they're saying former as in no one knows. You see, we've been taught that you can't know God. He's unpredictable. That is not what I'm seeing. All you have to do is read the stories in the Old Testament, and you'll see that God is completely predictable because he has told you what he will do. Let's go to the next one in the list. It goes to Lamentations 2 verse 17. 
It says, The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and he has pitied. He has caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He has set up the horn of thine adversaries. Well, that's just what I said. The part they miss, you know, the, they're picking these verses to support the concept of sovereignty and say, I, I think they're just focusing on the last part. He says, he hath thrown down, he hath not pitied, he hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee, he hath set up the horn of thine adversaries. Yes, in context, because God has fulfilled his word. It says it right there. Are they that focused on teaching sovereignty that they can't actually read the context within the verse? He has fulfilled his word. He's declared all of this before. It's not unknown. He has declared that in full. This is the... This is what's going to happen. If you do this, this is the this will happen. This curse will happen. If you do this, this blessing will happen. Yes. It's it's so straightforward. And, but how can you read that and not see that? I know. You have to be blinded, which is exactly what the apostles said would happen. Mm-hmm. I see it this this way. It's another god. It's another god. And if you're going to serve another God, you will be blind yeah. to the true character of God. Yeah. This is how blind they are. They can actually read a verse and only choose the words out of that verse that seem to match their doctrine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the first part of that verse, they would ignore. Yeah. The Lord hath done that which he has devised. Yes, he has devised it. He has told you what he will do previous through their fathers noah abraham isaac jacob moses he's laid all this out before Mm -hmm. he's only keeping his word i think we hit the nail on the head when we were talking one of the sessions about you see sovereignty teaching they teach that god is unpredictable and they teach that god is infinite and we are finite Okay, so they'll use that as an excuse. Because we're finite, then we can't know God. Then what's the book for then? We've got it in black and white. Everything. There's nothing unpredictable about God. He is totally the other way. He is predictable because he's given us his word. He will keep his word. He will keep every promise. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nehemiah 9, 6 says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all the things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein. Thou preparest them all, and the host of heaven worships thee. Why are they choosing that verse for sovereignty? Because doesn't that make sense? God made everything. But you see, when you believe that God controls every molecule, every event in a person's life, every good thing and every bad thing that happens in life, you will read control into that verse. Not creation, not provision. And then I love, when from that verse, you can read on. It's really cool. Verse 7, Thou art the Lord, the God, who did choose Abram and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name of Abraham. Those that teach sovereignty would focus in the word choose. Mm -hmm. But the next verse tells you why. Verse 8, The Lord found his heart faithful, Abram's heart was faithful to God. And you made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, 
and has performed his words, for thou art righteous. See, why did he choose Abraham? Because Abraham's heart was faithful to him. Here's this concept that I watched a couple of fellas on a YouTube channel talking about if we allow Calvinism to affect our thinking, we start thinking that God is a narcissist. They were saying that in the church, what we've taught about God is that he is a narcissist. He controls everything. I think that's enlightening mm -hmm. for them to realize that yes, Calvinism, when it goes far, far enough, that you believe that God is a narcissist. I mean, he's not what he says he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's not merciful. He's not fair. But see, these are all the things that God says about himself. I am merciful. I am fair. Yeah. I believe this is where a lot of people begin. You know what? I'm interested in God. I, I'd like to know a little bit more. And one of the first things they do, it's too bad. One of the first things they do, instead of opening up their Bibles and reading God's words directly, they go to a church because now they're convinced that they have to hear it from someone secondhand. Wow. That's how far we've gone. You can't have a relationship with God unless you go to church. Then you have to listen to men's opinions and teachings. They would be far better off just open up a Bible and read. So let's go uh, to the next one on the list, which I find interesting. It's Hebrews 1.3. <laughs> I'm like you, Mark. I was reading this and thinking, how in the world can you read this and then believe in sovereignty. How blind are you? Again, to the context within the verse. Because the verse says, who, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, God's glory, and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. How can you read that verse and then believe that verse is supporting sovereignty? I don't get it. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Well, that's the phrase, you yeah, think? That's what I think. They're reading that phrase, yeah. upholding all things by the word of his power? Well, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's all about control. Mm -hmm. And by the way, why are these people so adamant about saying that God is controls 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 what is their problem blame the society they're not responsible for anything we're not responsible because every everything else is controlled mm -hmm. then we don't have to choose mm -hmm. is that it i think what we're doing we're taking the nature of man which is to be a narcissist to be a control freak mm -hmm. now i'm not talking about all people but it seems to me that people that end up in leadership, the reason they're in leadership is because they want to be at the top of the heap. Now, they might have a small heap or a big heap, but they want to be at the top. I truly believe that. People are trying to be leaders because they want to be at the top. That fits a narcissist's nature. They want to control. So I believe they then, because those are leaders now, they're teachers, they will then control us, and they want a God of control, so they will put that nature of control onto God. That's why they'll come right out and say, well, he's a narcissist. They may not use that word, but they'll, they'll say that God controls, or God allows evil. It doesn't matter how soft you say it, you're still making God look like an unpredictable narcissist that's only interested in himself. I do not see that nature in God. No, I don't see that nature in Christ at all. Not at all. 
Now, as we're reading Hebrews 1.3, let's read it now the way we see it. Jesus, being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That is wonderful news. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem. As I've said many times before, if you take God and you, you make God is in your own image, then you have to take Jesus and fit him into that image. I believe that's why they can read Hebrews 1.3 and bypass the first couple of phrases in this paragraph. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't understand that Jesus was the express image of God, see, they do it the other way. They, they create their God first, and then they try to make Jesus match that character, mm -hmm. the one they've built. We need to be the other way completely. Mm -hmm. We start with Christ. That's what we're learning in our other study of the foundation. We start with Jesus as the foundation of who God is. That's why God sent his son. Mm -hmm. To clarify, as I said in the last couple of weeks, I was talking about the glory of God is revealed in Christ. The glory is all that God is. And he's the, uh, it's, to, it's to shine brightly of who you are. Mm -hmm. Now, it really fits God's nature once you know who he is. Mm -hmm. That glory shines in Christ, who God really is. Yeah. That glory was realized in Christ. Yes. Now, I want to back up to go to verse 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's why I love reading the Old Testament. Because I get a flavor of who God really is through the prophets, yeah. calling the people back to the true nature of God instead of these man-made gods that they have. Then it says, Has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now that's the connection of Jesus being the word of God. Because the word of God made the worlds. Yeah. And Jesus was the word of God made flesh, came alive and lived with us. The word of God in a man, the glory of God in a man. And we did not know what that glory was until he spoke. Yeah, that, that is, that's exactly the same thing that happened to Moses on the mountain. When yes. God spoke, he saw his he saw his glory. Yes. God didn't reveal anything yeah. to Moses. He just spoke to Moses. Yeah. Yeah. And by those words he revealed who God was. Sure. Sure. That's the true glory is the words of God. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1:15 says, "Who talking about Christ is the image of the invisible God." the firstborn of every creature. Oh, and it goes on to say the same thing that Hebrews said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And uh, that ties back to John chapter 1 that says, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son declared him.